Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to this History Reclaimed webinar, uh, one of a series uh, where leading historians uh, explain a central problem uh, in recent history. And it's my great pleasure to introduce this afternoon uh, Saul David, uh, a very well-known military historian and broadcaster. Saul was educated at Edinburgh and Glasgow universities, and he's the author of many books and articles, mainly on military history. I suppose he's best known for a series of works on the Indian Mutiny, published in 2003, a history of the Zulu Wars, published the following year, and a more general history of imperial wars, Victoria's Wars, the rise of empire in 2007, and all three of those books were published by Penguin. His most recent book, published a couple of years ago, was a history of the Special Boat Service uh, in the Second World War, and he's now at work, indeed finishing, and to be published next year, uh, a study of British airborne forces, parachutists, in the Second World War, to be entitled Sky Warriors, so that's one to look out for. But today, uh, I'm delighted that he's moved back in time to consider the 18th century. And his title for us is The Rise of the British Empire, 1763 to 1815. Saul. Thanks so much, Lawrence. I'm just gonna share the screen uh, so that the uh, PowerPoint comes up and here's the opening slide. Um, yes, well, it very much is taking me back to uh, the Indian Mutiny uh, and, of course, the, the context for what would become my book, Victoria's Wars, uh, looking at the rise of the British Empire in this key period. In his book, The Expansion of England, published in 1883, historian Robert John Robert Seeley argued that the growth of the British Empire was made possible by the defeat of Louis XIV's France in the War of the Spanish Succession. That, of course, was 1701 to 1714. He added, and of course, this is the relatively well-known quote, we seem, as it were, to have conquered and peopled half the world in a fit of absence of mind. And I'm just trying to make this slide move on. There it is, sorry, we've got it now. Um, the truth, of course, is much more nuanced, uh, as I'm sure we know, but with little political capital to be made from imperial ventures and mindful of the expense, home governments tended to discourage imperial expansion, uh, and that it took place at all, therefore, was chiefly the responsible responsibility of individuals on the ground, diplomats, soldiers, trading houses, and occasionally maverick adventurers. In 1615, uh, wrote Neil Ferguson in Empire, How Britain Made the, one, the Modern World. The British Isles had been an economic, had been an economically unremarkable, politically fractious and strategically second class entity. 200 years later, Great Britain had acquired the largest empire the world had ever seen, encompassing 43 colonies in five continents. Now, there were th three main elements to this rise of empire, commerce, conquest, and colonization. To illustrate all three empires, I propose to look at the period from 1763, the end of the Seven Years' Wars, to 1815 and victory for Britain in the Napoleonic Wars. On the 10th of February, 1763, Britain, France, and Spain signed the Treaty of Paris with Portugal in agreement and formally brought the Seven Years' War to a close. It had been fought across, across the globe partly for reasons of imperial competition and partly to settle the age-old question of which power would dominate Europe by Britain and Prussia on the one side and France, Austria and Spain on the other. As with pre previous treaties, this one ensured that the majority of con conquered territories were restored to their former owners. Only Britain, it turned out, was ceded large tracts of new territory, chiefly in North America, where, where she received Canada and Louisiana east of the Mississippi, not including New Orleans from the French, and Florida from the Spanish. The peace left Britain the master of North America, the possessor of lucrative new sugar islands and slave stations, and France all but finished as a political and commercial power in India. And this slide will give you a sort of sense of where we are in 1763. Now let's concentrate on India a little bit, my area of speciality, you might call it. 
Um, there's no better illustration of the contingent and unplanned nature of empire than Britain's long association with the Indian subcontinent. It began with Queen Elizabeth's the first granting of a royal charter to the London trading house known as the Honourable East India Company on the 31st of December 1600. By 1700, the East India Company had permanent trading posts at Madras, Bombay and Calcutta, and its only serious competitors were the French companies based at Pondicherry on the southeast coast and Chandanaga on the Huli River. The company's success was based on the seemingly insatiable demand in Europe for cheap calico, chintz, silks, fine china and tea. During the first half of the 18th century, its annual dividends never fell below 6%, its yearly sales of two million made up a fifth of Britain's total annual imports. Preeminent on the London stock market, it occupied a position in the city comparable only to that of the Bank of England. The company's gradual metamorphosis from mercantile to political power was prompted by the death of Aurangzeb, the last of the Mughal emperors in 1707. His, his successors fought a lengthy war of succession as the Mughal emperor, empire began to disintegrate and former governors, vassal princes and soldiers of fortune began to carve out their own independent states. To protect its valuable trade during this time of political flux, the East India Company stepped up its recruitment of Indian troops. It had been enlisting modest numbers of Indian soldiers or sepoys since 1684, but it was not until the wars with the French in the 1740s that the need for a permanent regular army became evident. Led by Major Stringer Lawrence and his deputy Robert Clive, these troops inflicted a string of defeats upon the French and their allies in the early 1750s at the as the British consolidated their economic and military presence in southern India. But the event that were to establish the East India Company as a powerful political force in the subcontinent took place in the province of Bengal, the richest and most populous in India. In 1756, jealous of the company's favoured position, in particular its permanent trading station at Calcutta and its exemption from transit levies, the 21-year-old Nawab of Bengal, Siraj Udawla, ordered his troops to occupy the East India Company's bases at Kazim Bazaar in Calcutta. During the night of the 20th of June, scores of European prisoners died at the Calcutta base after being crammed into a small and airless room, the so-called Black Hole of Calcutta. Given the task of punishing Siraj, Robert Clive sailed from Madras with 100 European soldiers and 900 sepoys and reoccupied Calcutta on New Year's Day, 1757. Two months later, having raised the 1st Battalion of Bengal sepoys, Clive captured the, the French base at Chandanagar. He then negotiated a secret alliance with a group of Calcutta's leading merchants and bankers, and also with one of Siraj's senior commanders, and gave battle at the village of Plassey, 80 miles north of Calcutta, on the 23rd of June, 1757. Though hugely outnumbered by 3,000 soldiers to 50,000, he won the battle thanks to his superior artillery and the defection of part of Siraj's army. The new Nawab, Mir Jaffa, ceded tax districts to the company and dismantled the state control of inland trade. When his successor tried to reassert Bengal's independence, his army was heavily defeated by the company forces at Buxar on the 23rd of October, 1764. Thus began a long period of commercial and territorial expansion throughout India as obdurate states were annexed and the more amenable became allies. In 1773, to put the government of, of parts of India on a legal footing, the British government passed the, Ju the British Parliament, sorry, passed the Judicata and Regulating Acts, which established the Supreme Court in Calcutta and the principle by which the British government could interfere in the affairs of India, as well as creating the framework for the company's rule. This was followed in 1884 by the passing of the India Act, which gave executive control of Indian affairs to the newly created Board of Control in London, whose president was a cabinet minister and, theref and therefore answerable to Parliament. When Richard Wellesley, the second Earl of Mar Mornington, became Governor General of Bengal in May 1798, the total extent of territories controlled by the East India Company was still relatively modest. Uh, and I'll just give you an idea of that when we have a look at this slide here. The Bengal presidency was made up of just Bengal, Bihar, 
and Benares, the last two provinces acquired in 1775 and 1781, respectively, the Bombay presidency was confined to a relatively small area around the city of Bombay, while the Madras Confederacy was little more than a few scattered districts. And yet, within seven years, by means of treaty and conquest, Mornington, or Marquis Wellesley as he became, had added huge tracts of land to each presidency, bringing British control to roughly half the subcontinent. So that's the difference between the two slides, uh, 1785 and 1804. And you're looking chiefly, of course, at the red areas. Wars were fought against a number of princely states that threatened British supremacy, Mysore in the south and the, Maratha, and the Maratha Confederacy in central and northern India. The fourth and final Anglo-Mysore War ended in 1799 with the defeat of Tipu Sultan's European trained army and the capture of his capital, Seringapatam, by Mornington's brother, the then Colonel, the Honourable Arthur Wellesley. And there's a of course, the well-known slide of the last effort and fall of Tipu Sultan by Henry Singleton. Mysore was broken up and the bulk of its territory were annexed by the East India Company. But Wellesley also played a major role in the company defeat of the Maratha Confederacy and a war that lasted from 1803 to 1805, including a crushing victory over the forces of Maharaja Sindhya of Gwalior at Assay on the 23rd of September, 1803. A battle, uh, by the way, that Wellington always felt, well, Wellington as he became, was his finest victory. Once again, the odds were heavily stacked in the local army's favor with 50,000 men and 128 guns to Wellesley's 7,022 guns. Yet he decided to attack at Assay because he believed aggression was the only way to defeat a numerically superior Indian foe. Despite suffering a crippling 1,584 casualties, 650 of them British, he won the day by killing and wounding more, more than 6,000 of the enemy. When asked years later what was the best thing he ever did in the way of fighting, he replied with one word, as I've mentioned, not Waterloo, but a say. Well, while, while one part of the, North, of the empire was expanding in the east, another receded in North America. The ostensible cause, of course, was financial, but this was really about imperial control of white settlers from the metropolitan center. The first successful American colony was established by the Virginia Company at Jamestown in Virginia in 1607. This was followed in 1620 by the arrival of 149, of 149 on the Mayflower at Cape Cod in what became New England. A third were pilgrims, Protestant fundamentalists fleeing England for religious reasons, but the majority went for economic reasons, to make a living by catching fish. Another good quote by Neil Ferguson. This then was the combination that made New England flourish, Puritanism, Puritanism plus the profit motive. It was a combination institutionalized by the Massachusetts Bay Company, founded in 1629. Now, if we fast forward to the 18th century, uh, and New England had bigger farms, bigger families, and better education than the old Englanders back home. They also paid less tax. In 1763, the average Briton paid 26 shillings a year. By contrast, the typical resident of Massachusetts paid a single shilling. Being British subjects had been good for this pe these people. So what, when then were they, so why then, sorry, were they the first to throw off the yoke of imperial authority? Well, the answer, of course, lies in the attempt by Britain to impose a number of centralizing initiatives and to make America pay its share of the huge government debt that Britain had incurred in winning the recent war against the French. Of course, the Indians, uh, of course, the Americans had played their part in the victory during the six years of the French and Indian War, as it was known in North America. They had raised armies totaling 75,000 men. And during Geoffrey Amherst's two pronged campaign of 1759, the decisive engagement of the war, the troops provided by the six northern colonies had far exceeded the number of British regulars. As well as their sacrifice on the battlefield, colonists had supplied the armies, built ships, and paid exorbitant war taxes. After the fall of Quebec, Americans in the northern provinces had celebrated every bit as rapturously as Britons, with bonfires, bell ringing, and sermons of thanksgiving. Their patriotism knew no bounds, I am a Briton, declared Benjamin Franklin, the distinguished scientist, diplomat, and man of letters, and many Americans shared his enthusiasm. 
Peace in 1763 promised a new era of Anglo-American cooperation, but it lasted barely a year. For not only was Britain deeply in debt, she was also committed to keeping eight, uh, eight and a half thousand troops in newly won Canada and the Trans-Appalachian West, populated by unruly Indian tribes and some 9,000 French Canadian Catholics. To raise the additional revenue required, George Grenville's government increased taxes at home and abroad, levying duties on the colonists for the first time in an attempt to raise some of the 220,000 pounds of annual cost of policing North America's new frontier. Many MPs thought the new duties were justified. The colonies had been founded with British help, they argued, and it was only right that the inhabitants should contribute to the cost of their security. What was not discussed in Parliament was the government's hidden agenda to use old trade laws and new taxes to strengthen its control over the colonies. For their part, the American colonies had never been subjected to metropolitan taxation with funds for local government vetoed by the colonists' own assemblies. While acknowledging allegiance to the crown, they considered themselves independent of parliament and their assemblies co-equal to it. They therefore refused to pay the new levies and grounded their resistance on the principle that a Britain was only liable to be taxed by his own representatives, whereas they had no London MPs. The first direct tax, and by far the most controversial, was the Stamp Act of 1765, which required all printed materials in the colonies, including legal documents, magazines and newspapers, to be produced on paper embossed with a revenue stamp that had to be paid for in British currency. It was opposed by Benjamin Franklin, by now regretting his earlier enthusiasm for Britain, and widespread protests in America, and was withdrawn after barely a year. Yet at the same time, Parliament reasserted its right to tax the colonies, a right that Franklin and many Americans objected or rejected with the cry, no, ta no taxation without representation, by passing the Declaratory Act, which insisted it had the power to legislate for the colonies in all cases whatsoever. This was followed in 1767 by various external duties on imports such as paper, lead, glass and tea, called the Townsend Acts after Charles Townsend, then Chancellor of the Exchequer. The British government assumed the colonists' objection was only to direct or internal taxes like the Stamp Act and not to indirect or external taxes on imports. He was mistaken. They regarded any tax not imposed by the British, any sorry, any tax imposed by the British Parliament as unconstitutional and their opposition to these new, new duties was every bit as fierce as it had been to the Stamp Act. The final straw, as is well known, was the passing of the Tea Act in 1773. To evade the tea duty, Americans had been smuggling Dutch tea and so reducing the import of legitimate tea from the British-owned East India Company by almost two-thirds. The Act was an attempt to shore up the company's profits, by allowing it to sell directly to America and thereby skipping England and its customs duties of two shillings and six p per pound, six pence per pound, even with the Townsend duty of three uh, d per pound still applicable, the Act would have enabled the East India Company to undercut the smugglers and make tea cheaper in America. But the colony, colonists were not prepared to pay the duty on principle, nor were they happy to give the East India Company a, mon a monopoly on the tea trade, and they refused to allow the tea to land. This culminated in the Boston Tea Party of the 16th of December 1773, when American activists disguised as Native American, Americans boarded three company ships and dumped 342 chests of tea in Boston Harbor. Britain retaliated by passing the Coercive Acts that, amongst other things, closed the port of Boston until the East India Company had been compensated in full and placed the local government under crown control. The American colonies responded by meeting at the First Continental Congress in 1774 and agreeing to boycott British imports until all laws concerning them since 1763 were repealed. With both sides digging in, the shooting war began in April 1775 at the hamlets of Lexington Concord near Boston, as British troops were engaged by Massachusetts militia as they attempted to arrest two leading rebels and destroy military supplies. It was always uh, going to be a difficult war for the British to win, 
They lack the military and naval resources to not only win battles, but police a largely, a largely recalcitrant population. Their victories, and they won many, merely served to reinvigorate the, power, the revolutionary cause by stimulating recruitment and prompting greater unity among the rebels. They made a fatal miscalculation that loyalists were in a majority and would rally in support of the army. They were, ha they were hampered by the logistical nightmare of transporting supplies and reinforcements 3,000 miles across the Atlantic, and their weak political system diluted unity of purpose. Finally, the entry of France in 1778 and Spain in 1779 on the rebel side left Britain overstretched and without a major ally. Even so, uh, there were opportunities for the British to win, the best falling to the Howe brothers, General Sir William and Admiral Richard, army and naval commanders from 1776 to 1777, respectively, who failed to follow up victories at New York to trap and destroy George Washington and the Continental Army and attack and burn ports along the coast. They were not taken, explains Andrew, o Andrew O'Shaughnessy in The Men Who Lost America, because the brothers, and I quote, favoured a more humane approach to war. Sorry, I missed out on that one. Uh, in order to win both the support of the people and create the conditions necessary for a harmonious post-war reconstruction of civil government. Even later in the war, says O'Shaughnessy, the weakness of the revolutionary central government and its virtual state of bankruptcy might have still turned the war in Britain's favour, but the loss of naval supremacy after the strategic defeat at the Battle of Chesapeake Cape in 1781 caused in turn, Cornwall, Cornwallis's surrender at Yorktown and marked the beginning of the end. The Treaty of Paris, signed in September 1783, confirmed the independence of the new American Republic, including the Trans-Appalachian West of the Mississippi River and the contested states of Georgia and South Carolina, but not Canada, which remained under British rule. Separate treaties were also signed with France, Spain and Holland that, that led to the return of all possessions conquered during the war, though Britain was also forced to relinquish territory in Africa and India to France and Menorca and Florida to Spain. The terms of the treaty with France would undoubtedly have been worse had not Britain, in the form of Admiral, Admiral Hood, defeated de, de Grasse's French fleet at the Battle of the Saints in April 1782 a victory that prevented a Franco-Spanish invasion of Jamaica and re-established Britain's naval supremacy. Britain had been attracted to the continents of Asia and America by trade and land respectively. The allure of the third continent, Australia, with its red earth, eucalyptus trees and kangaroos, was for a diametrically different reason, because it was impossibly remote and a natural prison. Thus, within a few years of its discovery by Captain Cook in 1770, New South Wales had been identified as the place to send criminals. Transportation of criminals to the colonies had been in practice since the early 1600s, though it did not become a formal part of the penal system in, in, until 1717. For the next century and a half, minor offenders could be transported for seven years instead of being flogged or branded, while men on, on commuted capital sentences could be transported for 14 years. By 1777, 40,000 men and women had been transported to the Amer American colonies. With the loss of these colonies, a new repository was required and Australia seemed to fit the bill. It was also a strategic consideration to settle New South Wales before an imperial rival did so. On the 18th of January, 1788, therefore, the first fleet carrying six, 736 unwanted British convicts, including 188 women and 210 Marine guards reached Botany Bay in Australia. The harsh hinterland was completely unexplored. And yet within a few years, the dregs of British society had established a viable settlement that would grow into the city of Sydney. The commander of the convict fleet was the first Governor of New South and the first governor of New South Wales was Captain Arthur Phillips, RN. The plan had been to settle in Bot Botany Bay, but a quick reconnaissance caused Phillips to prefer the neighboring inlet of Port Jackson. We had the satisfaction, he wrote, of finding the finest harbour in the world in which a thousand sail of the line may ride in the most perfect security. 
For his landing site, he chose a cove seven miles inside the harbour with good anchorages and level ground. He named it Sydney Cove in honour of Lord Sydney, the minister in charge of the colony. Forced to rely on an ever dwindling food ration, life was tough for the early settlers. Some stole food and were hanged, others tried to escape, with one party achieving the second longest open boat voyage in history before it was recaptured on the Dutch island of Timor. Yet by late 1792, when Philip departed, more than 4,000 people had survived the Sydney experiment. Brick houses had been built, land cleared, and trade was beginning to flourish. In 1807, the first consignment of merino wool, wool was shipped to Britain at a time when the Yorkshire cloth industry had just been deprived of its Saxon and Spanish imports. Demand soared, and by 1821, there were 290,000 sheep in Australia. In all, from 1787 to 1853, around 123,000 men and 25,000 women were transported to Australia from crimes ranging from forgery to sheep stealing. Among the convicts were political prisoners, including Luddites, food rioters, tollpuddle martyrs, and chartists. Yet unlike the American colonists, Australians stayed loyal to the imperial project, fought for Britain in two world wars, and still retained the monarch as head of state today. Uh, just a quick couple of uh, images here. This is the British Empire in 1815. And for a comparison, the British Empire at its apogee or near its apogee, its apogee, I think was uh, 1922, but here's near its apogee in 1907. It is fashionable, of course, uh, to assert today that no good came out of the British Empire. And needless to say, I do not agree. Of course, imperial sins need to be acknowledged. The empire was never altruistic per se. Britain grew rich on the slave trade with 3 million of the 10 million or so Africans who crossed the Atlantic before 1850 doing so in British ships. Yet Britain, it should be acknowledged, was just as zealous in trying to stamp out slavery in the 19th century. Other sins include, include the practice of forms of racial discrimination and segregation that today we, we would find abhorrent. When imperial authority was challenged, the response tended to be brutal. When famine, when famine struck, the reaction was negligent at best. A favorite charge made against the East Company in particular by popular historians such as Shashi Tharoor and William Dalrymple is that its officials were venal and its violent subjugation of the subcontinent, subcontinent an economic disaster for Indians. These claims were exploded by the 2021 publication of An Economic History of India, 1707 to, 17, to 1857, by Professor Tathanka Roy of the London School of Economics, India's leading, leading economic historian, who gives a data-based assessment of, the Mughal, of why the Mughal world was in deep decline well before the dominance of the East India Company, and why company officials, far from ruining India, gave it an institutional an economic model on which modern nation, nationhood could be built. Many Indians, write, writes Roy, because they did not trust other Indians, wanted the British to secure power. They preferred British rule over indigenous alternatives and helped the company to form a state. Moreover, the company succeeded in trade because it could pool in capital, in a lot of capital, offer incentives to its employees, build stable collaboration with Indian agents and brokers, understand and study markets, and get goods manufactured to exact specifications. Roy is aware of the company's shortcomings, pointing out that its greatest failing was prioritizing military spending over public goods, thus failing to transform rural livelihoods apart from some investment in canals. The best defense of that dismal record, says Roy, is that the Mughals or the Marathas were no better at meeting that challenge. Roy's findings contradict the popular drain theory that blames the company and the Raj for divesting India of its wealth by uh, payments of silver abroad. In reality, says Roy, the colonial government was a tiny part of the economy and its remittances abroad were offset by silver that flowed in via India's trade surplus. He also points out that the return of peace to northern India under company control from 1800 was a major stimulus to trade, linked downriver to the world market via Calcutta. Overall, says Roy, 
there was economic decline in India between 1689 and 1813, followed by recovery under colonial rule. Britain's imperial project had many faults, yet Neil Ferguson was surely right to conclude, no, no organization in history has done more to promote the free movement of goods, capital and labor than the British empire. And no organization has done more to impose Western norms of law, order, governance around the world. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Saul, for that uh, fascinating glimpse, uh, uh, really a kind of cross section of the empire over half a century and more. Uh, and we've seen its kind of decline in, in North America. But as you uh, so interestingly uh, tell us, its, um, its rise uh, in India. Um, and it's really there that I'd like to start, if I may, um, with, uh, with a question. You used the phrase at the end, um, imperial project. Um, and yet you could easily, given the way you've structured your talk, say, well, is this a project? Um, really, it's three very remarkable but very different um, types of, of colonialism, if you like, or simply types of economic and, uh, and social development. There, there isn't a common thread to what went on in Australia, to what went on in India, to what went on in, in North America. Um, that might be Seeley's absent-mindedness. Uh, I'm not sure if it is absent-minded. It just looks like three very different forms of uh, development and colonization. And I wonder if, if we might start there. Yes, uh, well, absolutely right. And the, the use of the term imperial project uh, is really, uh, it certainly wouldn't have been used at the, at the time, Lawrence. You, you're absolutely right. It, it, as, as you can see from the three different examples, there are multiple different reasons for for the expansion of empire and none of them are really driven from uh from london it, it tends to be uh, a situation in which people on the ground you can see for, for example in india uh the east india company is driving it so so trade is at the heart of it but you also get ambition you get people like Wellesley coming in there in the 1790s his brother of course he wanted to make a name for himself as a general and you so you can't underestimate the the uh empire building in inverted commas of people on the ground generally speaking both the period I've spoken about and certainly in the 19th century uh in a political sense empire building was a way to lose votes it was a way not to get you elected it wasn't uh popular with the british electorate really only towards the end of Victor victoria's reign do we see uh, uh the rise of uh jingoism and, and a kind of sense of some pride in the empire although i would argue even then it was never a majority of britons who felt like that um the general uh, assumption among uh, for the british government for most of this period is is that empire is expensive uh, and uh, as you can see, one of the reasons we lose uh, our empire in North America is because we expect it to help pay for its own defense. And if you move forward into the 19th century, Lawrence, you get the determination among the Brit British government to begin the sort of uh, a process of confederation, both for Canada and also they consider for South Africa. One of the reasons why you have all those wars at the end of the 19th century in South Africa, including the Boers, is there's the determination to create a confederation which will really be self-governing to a certain extent and will be able to pay for, mostly pay for its own defense. So a, 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 an idea that there was some kind of uh, central project in which uh, we would create this empire for multiple different reasons, but one of the main ones would be political, was never really a factor. It was, it was factors that were more relevant on the ground. Although, of course, you could argue that the, the uh, creation, or at least the start of, of what becomes uh, the Australian bit of the empire, was for reasons of you know domestic policy we had to do something with the prisoners so so it's it's not entirely to do with the the individuals out there that was a a decision that was taken at home but generally speaking empire was perceived to be expensive uh, and therefore it was these other actors who who were really driving it forward yes i i think it's disraeli uh, 
a surprising source who refers to the colonists in the mid-19th century as millstones round our neck. And that was yeah. a very uh, um, common view, really, until the 1870s and the 1880s, when empire becomes popular for different reasons, because it's being challenged for the first time by, by other empires, as it were. But I wonder, yeah. actually, if I could press you a little bit on, in a sense, that, that remarkable point that you and Neil Ferguson and others have made, that in 1615, Britain is a minor power, uh, really, you know, a, a, an island off the coast of Europe and not a big player militarily and so forth. Uh, two centuries later, as you've explained, it is, you know, the dominant uh, force in the world. And ask you, in a sense, as a military historian, perhaps, uh, why you think that should be? Um, what is it that drives this? Uh, is it technology? Is it military expertise? And you talked about Wellington, for example, and and uh, his use of, of sepoy troops and so on. Or is it actually better administration? Although we have the, the, the American example of failed administration, you do have the sense that British government is perhaps more in control of these events, or at least more able to organize an imperial project than say other European governments at that time. So I just wonder if, if there's a domestic way of explaining this. Yeah, and I, I, well, the answer is there is. Uh, and, and, and I think it comes down to m multiple different things. I mean, w one of my uh, earlier books uh, was on the on the story of the British Army from its creation, really, in the in the late seventeenth century to the the period we've just been discussing, so the Waterloo, uh, and what you can see uh, as the British Army fights its way around the world is is uh, two things really underpinning it: technology, the technological changes, which were, of course, we tended to benefit from being a kind of leading industrial nation. Uh, but secondly, and vitally, finance, um, creation of the Bank of England towards the end of the 17th century, which was just uh, at, at, at the period in which we were fighting what, what was going to become one of the longest global conflicts in our history. And that, of course, is the War of the Austrian Succession. So it's not a coincidence, I think, that the, uh, the, 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 the rise of Britain as a kind of serious player in European politics and certainly in global affairs with 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 empire was uh, the war of the Austrian succession. So what's going on there is, that first of all, you've got this kind of really solid underpinning this ability to borrow money for the government and therefore be able to finance a, 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 a long world war. War. But you've also got extraordinary technological developments going on, uh, such as they were at the time, the flintlock, the bayonet, they don't sound much to the today, Lawrence, but, no. but at the time, they were actually absolute game breakers in, in, in terms of the way armies fought. And, it, and they made the British army or they allowed the British army to become the most formidable on the battlefield and supplant the French, which had always had that reputation from uh, from the 17th century, uh, in particular, Louis the 14th. Uh, armies and so this was a huge huge change and of course allied to all of this i mustn't forget as a as a military historian who tends to uh, um specialize in the army but we mustn't forget the development of the navy too and the money of course you know i refer of course to nicholas rogers wonderful books uh, on, on the navy uh nam rogers uh, uh command of the ocean in particular were absolutely underpins the financial and administrative aspect that allowed the Navy to get, and of course, all the tactical and the geniuses. I mean, you know, I, I haven't even mentioned Marlborough. Um, we, we were very fortunate to, uh, is it luck? I don't know, to coincide with the finance and the technology, but also to have a number of absolutely brilliant commanders. And of course, in the war of the Austrian succession, it, it is the Duke of Marlborough. Um, the reason that the, 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 the Palace of Blenheim is the largest private house in the country is because the nation was very grateful for Marlborough's, um, you know, almost unbroken run of astonishing military successes over the French uh, mm -hmm. and others during the War of the Austrian Succession. So you're, you're right to, to, to query um, whether something was unique, un uniquely happening in, in Britain at that time. Uh, and... I, but I think the single most important factor was probably finance in all of this uh, and the ability of, of British governments from the end of the 17th century onwards to be able to finance wars was, you know, a, a really important factor. Uh, and when you're fighting the French, you didn't have anything like the same ability to borrow money. Um, in the end, you, you had a huge advantage.
Yes, I wonder also if perhaps the way Britain governs its colonies has some 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 uh, contribution to make to this story of the rise of empire. Uh, although in some ways you present, you know, a counter example, the American example, where, uh, as it were, because Britain is so lightly governing those colonies for 150 years since the early 17th century, the first attempt to exert a more centralized control, and obviously with that comes taxation, to uh, as it were, get the colonists to pay for their, their defense, leads to uh, a colonial rebellion, if you like. Uh, but nonetheless, often people make the point that the British Empire is organized differently from other European empires, which are much more centralized, which are much less uh, flexible. Um, and that allows for a more kind of empirical, uh, less directed approach uh, which, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, makes for that flexibility that allows the empire to grow, perhaps organically, rather than a kind of um, imposition of a particular policy, as in the case of France or Spain or whatever. Uh, and I wonder if that has something to do with it also. I think it does. And I think the, the greatest example of that is is India. I mean, I, I've talked, I, I spoke about the the, 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 the expansion of the, of the empire in India, but to, to, to kind of drill down into that a little bit, you, you have a most extraordinary system where the British government has really uh, <laughs> allowed a, 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 a business in effect, a, you know, a, a, a large business, large and successful trading company to rule on behalf of it. I mean, it, it creates this kind of extraordinary dual system whereby it has overall control. I mentioned some of the acts in which the British government was trying to it, it, impose some kind of control uh, because, you know, there have been certain controversies over venality and the, the idea that actually, you know, if, we, if we're going to control territory in India, the British government must have some kind of say in all of that. But it was an extraordinary dual system all the way up until the Indian mutiny, uh, uh, the Great Rebellion of 57. Uh, you know, another subject of mine, which you've, you've already mentioned, Loris, Lawrence, and, and it's only after the, the mutiny uh, th that the government is forced to come in and, and really create a kind of a, a more traditional form of government. And yet even then, there is a relatively light touch. Yes, they've got these district officers and the, 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 the uh, uh, and commissioners, this kind of system of centralized control, but it is a relatively lightly uh, uh, worn system that gradually, of course, as the, uh, uh, as the years after 1858, when, when full crown control is imposed, mm -hmm. Um, there's a there's a desire to to now co-opt the I Indians into this system uh, with a with an assumption. I mean, another a very interesting point I think made by a, a historian of empire is is really the the British Empire was kind of inbuilt with a, a you know a, a time frame that was about bound to run out eventually, and I think that makes it unique also among other other European colonial systems in the sense that there was always an assumption that sooner or later we we would create uh, conditions where the the people we were ruling could rule themselves now that may have been for some people like churchill a long time in the future but nevertheless it was there so it was you know it it, it it, it, there was a there was a shelf life to the empire, an assumption that sooner or later we would we would hand it back to you know to the indigenous populations. Do you think that actually comes out of the American Revolution? I mean, do you think it's the experience of the 1770s and 1780s, uh, the recognition that uh, settlers will eventually want to govern themselves, and indeed, uh, as we see with those settlers, they will adopt what they believe to be British modes of, of government, British ideology, the sense yeah. of the people taxing itself and governing itself. This is, this is as it were, what it is to be a Briton uh, in the 18th century. Uh, and that having, as it were, negotiated and failed in the 1770s and gone to war, we learn a lesson and we then begin to think about the evolution of empire and indeed begin to think about having, if you like, a, an empire that will eventually dissolve itself uh, into self-governing uh, 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 nations and states. Yes, I do think uh, it, it's not unconnected to the experience there, but it's also not unconnected to to the financial aspect of empire and the, and the point I've already made, which is that the assumption that governing most of the empire was actually going to be more costly than it was going to be beneficial to the British crown i mean there are there are certain bits of the empire that did 
produce money for Britain. But uh, on the whole, uh, big chunks of it did not. And so uh, the quicker you can allow the locals to run things for themselves, particularly in terms of security, which is always expensive, uh, the better. And I think that was an important factor. But but there was also, a, a, you know, a genuine belief. I mean, um, that lovely quote by Kipling, white man's burden, which has often sort of been misconstrued. But the white man's burden was, you know, to to run things until until in, until the locals could take over and it, we you know it was it was sort of morally incumbent on us to do that i mean that was the, that was the assumption but there was still a belief ultimately that uh, you would you would create the right conditions for for the locals to ru to rule themselves when the time came the assumption you you're quite right though uh, lawrence was also uh, you will have created people you know you would have created a sort of commonwealth scenario where people are naturally going to feel some affinity uh, to the old mother country Country, uh, and in a security sense, uh, they will support you in times of war, which is exactly what happened, of course, with mm -hmm. certainly with the, with the uh, white colonies, uh, and to a certain extent with India, to, with India too. Although, of course, how India would genuinely have behaved without us still ruling in the first and second world wars, in terms of the support for Britain, is another matter. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly, mm -hmm. there seems to be a fair amount of evidence by the by the time of the Second World War that that you know colonial rule is not terribly popular, but for obvious mm -hmm. reasons um, that we can understand from the from the First World War onwards. Mm. I wonder if I can play devil's advocate here. I mean, you you quote Neil Ferguson, who of course argues in empire that the empire was a great force for modernization uh, yeah. and in yeah. that sense brought uh, huge advantages and blessings to many of the places uh, where the British planted the flag and you uh, create uh, and you also quote Professor Roy from the LSE you know making the point that um, uh, as it were uh, what the British Empire uh, succeeded the decline uh, of the Mughal e e Empire um, was much worse uh, than, as it were, what the British brought with them uh, and gave to India. But if you, as it were, apply a, a different view to that, um, that doesn't preclude exploitation. That doesn't preclude, no. uh, you know, looting of cultural artefacts and so forth. Um, that doesn't altogether preclude the sort of Dalrymple view, which may be extreme, but nonetheless, uh, it's possible to think of the two together. Yes, there are blessings and benefits, uh, but at the same time, uh, there is uh, violence and there is exploitation and so forth. I mean, can we balance those two as Nigel Bigger has attempted to do, you know, in, in as it were, a moral reckoning of empire? Uh, or are the two views simply incompatible uh, and we'll have to either choose one or the other? No, I mean, I, I wish I, I wish people hadn't chosen one one or the other. The 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 I mean, you know, as 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 with some of the Roy quotes I I, I gave, you you know, he's not he's not saying <laughs> he's no kind of great fan of the of the of the um uh, of the British Empire per se. He he is he coldly and dispassionately looked at the detail and uh, uh, the data uh, and come to the conclusion that actually in 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 terms of uh, the trade, in terms of the trade and the economic situation for India, the arrival of the British, if you take away all those other bits, which of course you can't when you're trying to do a kind of full full balance sheet, but maybe we need to get away from the balance sheet yeah. sort of yeah. approach per se. I mean, maybe that's part of the problem, if that that's sort of what you're hinting. And if it is, I, I rather agree with that. I, 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 you know, it's not, it's certainly, you're certainly not saying one or the other, and you're certainly not saying, well, you know, there was a lot of good as well, and therefore, you know, what, 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 what's the beef? I mean, frankly, if, if, if Britain uh, ha had been, and of course was, I suppose, at one stage <laughs> as part of the sort of Norman Empire, uh, you know, the the locals then, the the, the Anglo-Saxons would would have had every reason to resent the arrival of the Normans, and of course, the mm. Normans behaved incredibly brutally. So, I mean, the broader point here is that uh, that the nature of empire, I think, because it is imposing its will uh, whatever the whatever a, a few benefits um accrue out of that uh, will always be resented by a, a section of the of, of the population what the british uh, uh, that that it's ruling what the british were terribly good at doing is co-opting 
uh, local elites and uh, soldiers, of course, in the case of uh, India, they they uh, paid an awful lot of people to become mercenaries for them. They co-opted the princes at various times to, to support their rule. Uh, and that enabled them to, uh, in one sense, have a, a veneer of legitimacy. Look, some, some of the locals are actually supporting British rule, um, but also to, you know, to, to be able to control huge areas without needing vast armies. I mean, the, the whole point about the British Army is it's never been that big. I mean, it does make uh, the story of the British Empire the most remarkable, you know, I think probably the most remarkable story in the, in, you know, in the history of the world. You know, how is this tiny little trading nation with a relatively small army able to control what ultimately becomes a quarter of the world's surface? I mean, the, do, the, the moral element of it needs to be needs to be removed to a certain extent we, we it, what we're trying to do as historians is understand how it happened but we also want to we also want to be accurate and so mm. you can condemn aspects of the empire as as indeed I, I i mentioned in my talk without absolutely suggesting uh as some people will do today as we all know uh lawrence that there is uh, you know it, it was no good can come no no good ever came out of empire um yeah. and that yeah. seems to be a you know pretty facile view to, to hold because uh first of all world history is about empire so you may as well you know throw out the bathwater the baby with the bathwater uh, and and stop bothering the study of history frankly um but we do need to uh not do the you know the, the the full totting up in the end but just recognize it for what it is that that's frankly all or that, that's the approach i i've always taken in my history you know if you read my indian mutiny i've got i'm, I'm no fan of empire in that book uh, you know i make it quite plain that there were lots of failings that led to the the cause of the rebellion in 57 that though that the cause in my view was very different from the cause that you know a lot of other scholars have mm. taken uh scholars who have like william dalrymple have cited uh caste and religion as the main factors is another matter that's just historians disagreeing um that's yeah. that's what we like to do but what yeah. we don't like to be told is we can't write books about a subject and we can't really talk about a subject if we're going to do anything other than not criticize it that yeah that mm. is a historical in my view precisely and i think that history reclaimed exists as it were, to counter the moralization of history. Uh, and there is a place, there must be a place for telling the story and doing it in a reflective, but nevertheless an empirical and academic and sober way. And I completely agree. And in fact, you know, uh, this, this discussion we're having uh, draws upon some early discussions in this webinar series, uh, where we've talked about the ubiquity of empire. Human history is the history yeah. of empires. Uh, uh, and indeed, we've considered, you know, um, the project by Nigel Bigger to, as it were, advance a different view of empire, although he'd be the first to recognise, as he says in his book uh, on uh, empire uh, as a moral reckoning, that he's not writing history. He's actually engaged in a debate and a polemic. But there are those like yourself who write history, uh, who, as it were, want to, as it were, take empire away from that moral framework and tell us what actually happened. And there must be a, an academic space um, for that, it seems to me. And it's very important that academics can continue to write and talk about uh, imperial projects, British, French, or whatever, without having, as it were, uh, constantly to look over their shoulders as if what they're doing, uh, depending upon their conclusions, might be considered to be immoral or, or, or lacking in, in a moral dimension. Uh, so I think we're in agreement on the need uh, to keep history, as it were, and moralization uh, uh, separate, uh, because they have, as it were, entirely separate roles to play uh, when we think about the academic uh, study of the past. Um, so, yes, um, absolutely. I, 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 I'm sure we're in agreement. Um, Saul, is there anything that you feel we haven't discussed? Uh, anything more? <laughs> that you would like to add to our session this evening? No, I mean, you know, it's 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 been very refreshing for me, frankly, because as we were chatting before, Lawrence, you know, I've been working on the Second World War in, in recent books, um, you know, from a purely selfish and commercial point of view, it's, a, it's, it's still a conflict 
apparently black and white of course it's never as black and white as it seems that that uh you know people find it very easy to make up their minds about the the good and the bad in it uh, and as a result it it it, it tends to do quite well commercially it's also the greatest uh you know story in town so to speak there's never been a conflict uh before and probably never will be again we hope that can compare in all its horror and complexity and uh, uh and viciousness so uh it is uh you know to to make my point uh, really refreshing actually to go back to some of my earlier work uh, and to look back into the 18th century because you know, as we all agree, historians will all, all, always agree, I think, in anyone who loves history, it's the reason it's so important that we write the type of history that you've just been referring to, that we continue to write it, and therefore people continue to read it, is because it informs everything. You can't help, hope to understand the Second World War without a pretty long tale, a pretty long context uh, leading, leading up to that. And for us to, you know, understand any of the sort of current issues that are, you know, are troubling the world, Ukraine, uh, Palestine, even Brexit, you need to have a pretty good understanding of British history, but, but you know, uh, world history uh, more than that. So um, it is, it's useful for me to remind myself, actually, that I'm not <laughs> writing in the vacuum of the Second World War, that, you know, an awful lot that's highly relevant has come before it. Yeah. And you use the word there, saw complexity. And I think actually that's crucial to the historian's craft and that uh, perhaps there hasn't been enough focus on complexity uh, when people have come at the past in recent times. And it's our responsibility to remind people of complexity so that we don't rush to simple moral judgments, but actually uh, consider the history in all its dimensions. And I just want to say that I think that's what you've done uh, this evening. I mean, three fascinating case studies, each different, North America, uh, India and Australia, all, as it were, uh, uh, parts of empire in the late 18th century, um, but each case different. And thus, as it were, we need, we need to get deep into uh, the historical reality of these situations rather than generalise and moralise from, from afar. So I thank you very much indeed for, you know, a fascinating glimpse into imperial history with all its complexity and with all its interest. Thank you very much indeed, Saul David. Thank you. Thanks, Lawrence. Bye-bye.